Our scripture today is Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. Our sermon title this morning is baptism explained and I want to make clear this morning it's explained not so much by me but by the Apostle Paul (laughs) so the Apostle Paul is explaining baptism to a church he had never he had never met the church in Rome he hadn't been there yet and he is explaining baptism to them and he's saying this is what it meant when you were baptized So many of them were already baptized, and he's explaining to them the meaning. Uh, I'm sure there were others who were not yet baptized, uh, and he wanted this to be there for them. So he lays out uh, really the theology of baptism. What's it all about? And the first thing we see, number one, is baptism recognizes our death and burial our death and burial. Verse 2 says, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Verse 3 says, all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Verse 4 says, we were buried with him through baptism into death. Now, I don't know about you, when I first accepted Jesus, I didn't think much about the death part. I didn't really realize that there was a death and a burial involved. But Paul tells us that's what baptism symbolizes. If you look at it, really, when you go down into the water, that symbolizes burial. And when you come back up, that symbolizes resurrection. And you know, often what we do is we, we have that internal fight. We have that battle between wanting to do right, wanting to do wrong, you know, struggling, and it's miserable. <laughs> it's miserable. Because we're not comfortable enough with God to be at peace and glorify him because we know there's things in our lives that are still alive that shouldn't be. But you know what? Becoming a Christian, it ruins all the fun of sin in the world. Doesn't it? Because we have a conscience. And, you know, we feel guilty because we know we shouldn't be doing these things. And really, Paul gives us here the answer. There is a death and a burial involved. And 
I was probably a Christian for about two or three years until I heard this and figured it out. And I'll tell you what, it changed my life. It changed my life. When I really realized that I was supposed to die with Jesus. All of me, the parts of me that were of the sinful nature, everything without Christ, essentially, was to be buried and put to death. And you know, sometimes we think, and I've heard people say, well, I've always been a good person. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we were born sinners. And even the good things that we do, not that we can't do some good things before we're a Christian, but they're not eternally good things. They're not holy things. They're often just things that sort of benefit us in some way. Where there's a death involved. When we receive Jesus, we die to the old life. We die to sin. We die to the slavery of sin. You know, before we're a Christian, it's our nature to sin. It's our nature. You know, I look at the grandbabies and I look at the kids and nobody has to teach them how to sin. It just kind of comes natural, doesn't it? And that's how we all are. But you know, we have the ability in Jesus to put that slavery of sin to death and to bury it. And so baptism recognizes our death and our burial with Jesus. When Jesus went into the tomb, we picture ourselves with him. He died for us, and we, in a figurative way, die for him. Second, it's our crucifixion. Baptism recognizes our crucifixion. And maybe you're thinking, wow, I, I, I thought I was supposed to receive Jesus and everything was just supposed to be all good and fun and nice and everything, and I didn't realize I was supposed to die and be crucified. And, you know, when we first see this, it, it seems scary. It seems scary to nail to the cross those things that aren't from God. I remember a good friend of mine I, I was talking to, and he was struggling as a Christian. And he said, Ed, I don't know why, but he said, it just scares me to death to give up everything and to see myself as crucified with Christ. And, you know, I don't think that's really that abnormal of a feeling. Because we give up our rights, we give up our privileges, we give up even our accomplishments because they're wood, hay, and stubble that'll be burned up in the fire if they're not done for Jesus. We surrender our pride, we crucify our pride. And that's hard to do, isn't it? And it's scary to think about. We offer ourselves as living sacrifices and so baptism symbolizes that we have been crucified with Christ. That the body ruled by sin might be done away with. Now, the Romans had all kinds of torture methods that they used. One that they would use is they would strap people together with a dead body on the person's back. And a living person had to carry around the dead person and eventually the person who was living would get sick from carrying the dead person and have a slow terrible death and so that's what Paul's kind of referencing here he says who will get who will who will relieve me from this body of sin and you know that's kind of what it is as a Christian if we want to carry the old life around, the life that's dead, and it leads to death because the wages of sin is death, it kind of seeps into our lives and it slowly brings death to our faith. And Paul says we can crucify that. We can 
We can be delivered from that old self that just controls us. And so there's a, a death and there's a burial and there's a crucifixion involved. And Paul's telling these people who have already been baptized, many of them, you know when you were baptized, that's what you meant. That's what it symbolizes. So if you've already been baptized and you say, well, I didn't really know. That's okay. You didn't need to know now then. You can still apply it now. You can still apply it now. Because number three, it's our resurrection and new life. It's our resurrection and new life. You know what? As Christians, we don't just need cleaned up. We don't just need cleaned up. You know, I, I've told the story before, but I had a man come to me uh, years ago in a church, and I, he quit coming to church, and I called him, and his family was coming to church, and I was puzzled because he always seemed like he liked to be there. And so I called him and talked to him, and he said, Pastor, can I come to your church if I'm not a Christian? I said, well, sure. But let me ask, why would you ask that? He said, because I don't believe I'm ever going to be good enough to be a Christian, but I still want to come to church. And you know, that's good theology. None of us are ever going to be good enough to be a Christian. There has to be a death and a burial and a resurrection. We can't just clean ourselves up. We can't just get a list of rules of what Christians do and don't do. Mostly the don't do is the big part. There has to be a spiritual transaction of a death and a resurrection. And Paul's saying that that's what baptism shows you. That's what it means. You're buried with Jesus. You, gotta, you just got to put that old self away you got to put that old self to death and you know what sometimes you have to keep putting it back <laughs> Paul says I die daily and so we each day have to choose to recognize ourselves as being dead to sin but alive to Christ so <clears throat> when we come back back up out of the water we come with the resurrection power of Jesus to go on and do things that we never, ever, ever could have done in our own life and in our own strength. We have the resurrection power of Jesus living in us and through us to do spiritual things, to do lasting things, to do eternal things that we can never do on our own. So baptism, yes, it means our death, burial, and our crucifixion, but it also means coming back out of the water, a brand new life. Have you ever wanted a fresh start? <laughs> you know, you just felt like, oh, Lord, <laughs> give me a fresh start. Well, that's what this is. That's what this is. It's saying all the things that I did and I was apart from Christ, I'm going to bury those and I'm going to get a fresh start of living for Jesus. And you know what? We can do this anytime. Maybe you've been baptized a long time ago and you didn't realize that. We can still go back and we can identify that, you know what? That's what I did then and I want to live that out now. <clears throat> Paul will give us an application here in a minute of how to do that. Um, or maybe you say, you know what, I, I never really understood that, and I never really did that, and I want to be baptized, and I want, you know, I want to say to Jesus, I'm going under the water, and I'm dying out to who I used to be, and I want to be resurrected with new life and resurrection power. And it's a very real thing, you know, there's some mornings I need resurrection power just to get out of bed. Lord, help me, you know. Let alone to do anything eternal. And so we become dependent on the power of Jesus. Because our own, boy, it runs out pretty quickly. 
Just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And it doesn't matter how old you are, you can live a new life. And that's the promise in this passage. Yes, there's a death and a burial, but there's a resurrection. Then number four, we have hope in Christ. We have hope in Christ. If we look at verse five, it says, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. We always have hope of a resurrection. Yes, spiritually, baptism symbolizes that death and resurrection, but Jesus was raised from the dead literally, and we will be as well. And so we always have hope in the resurrection. We have hope for the present because you know what? Sometimes we need resurrected out of the messes we get ourselves into. You know, we do. The wages of sin are, is death, and we've got ourselves into some sinful messes that sometimes tie us up, make us slaves to sin, and we need God's deliverance from that. We need his help out of that. And you know, we have hope because we can start over. We can have that resurrection power, that new life, and that gives us hope. And then we always have hope for the future. You know, we get to live forever, you know that? <laughs> Jesus, when he was raised from the dead, he would never die again. And he lives on eternally. And it says our res resurrection will be like his resurrection. And so we have that hope of eternal life. And it's a secure hope. It's not just a wish. You know, once in a while you hear people say, well, well, I kind of hope I'll go to heaven. That's not very secure. Jesus gives us a real hope. He gives us a real hope. Because it's not based on us, it's based on him. It's based on his resurrection. And really the whole New Testament theology can be explained in this. He died paid the price for our sins and was resurrected for us. And it's a great exchange where we die out to who we are and live a new life for him. It's the great exchange. He gave his life for us and we give our life for him. But you know, we can't even do that by ourselves. We need his help even, to, even for that crucifixion. But we always have, have hope. We will be united like him in his resurrection. It says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey his evil, its evil desires. We have hope of deliverance from sin. You know, I counsel people during my job during the week that have a lot of different kinds of addictions. And to be honest, the recovery rate is not real great. I mean, we look around and we see this opioid crisis and we see people addicted to all kinds of things. And no matter what happens, it seems like only a very small percentage of them actually get better. But Jesus gives us a different approach. He gives us the ability to put to death that sinful nature because I think all sin is addictive. You do it once, it makes it more likely you're going to do it again. And then we can have real hope and real strength and the power of Christ himself to bring deliverance. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't still go through those programs or treatment or those things like that. What I'm saying is Jesus gives us something more. He gives us real hope. That, that body of sin, there's finally a way to get rid of it instead of just tug of war all, all the time. 
Now, it doesn't mean that you're not, never going to struggle with sin again. I wish I could tell you that. But what it does mean is that the battle's already been won and the decision has already been decided. And you just have to remind yourself, oh, that's right, I'm, I died to that. I died to that. And maybe you even want to say, oh, on August 18th, 2019, I died to that thing, that sin, that selfish part of me that I just have battled for so long. So there's always hope in Christ. Hope for really true victory over sin. Now the application, and basically all I did is copied in your, in your bulletin verses that Paul tells you what to do here. So Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit tells us what to do. He said, in the same way, the same way as Jesus died for sin and lives his life to God, count yourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Count yourselves. There's a choice there. The King James says, reckon yourselves. Reckon yourselves. I kind of like that because it's not a word we use very much. And, you know, Count yourselves. Make a decision. You know what? From this day forward, I'm going to put, put that part of me without Christ to death. Because even if you became a Christian years and years ago and there were some signs of life and you haven't done that, you're going to still continue to struggle. So he says, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. And you know, that, that has so many applications. Have you ever had somebody push your buttons? And maybe you kind of have some pride. It's like, no, nobody's getting, doing that to me and getting away with that. I'm going to fight back one way or another. But we can say, you know what? I'm dead to that. I'm dead to that. I can be alive like Jesus was, and when they insulted him, he gave no reply. I'm dead to that. Aren't you glad that we're dead to having to prove that we're somebody all the time, or to compete with the neighbors, or to see who can get the most toys, and all of those kind of things? Isn't it nice to be dead to that and say, you know what, I'm just living for Jesus? Dead to sin, alive to God. Count yourselves. Then number two, do not, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Don't let sin be your ruler. That's what reign means. Don't let sin rule your life. And boy, it does, doesn't it? Once it gets started, it's a, it's a merciless slave master, isn't it? Boy, you, you get started in sin and it just takes over. So don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. And that's why he said, count yourself dead to sin. Count yourself dead to sin. Remind yourself, hey, I'm dead to that. Number three, he gets real practical here. Do not offer any part of yourselves to sin as an instrument of wickedness. Again, the King James says, don't offer the members of your body, the parts of your body, your hands and your feet and your brain and your eyes and your mouth and your tongue and be pretty hard to sin with all those yielded to God. And so he makes it really practical. He says, Take, use the parts of your body, not for sin, but for righteousness. For righteousness. So yield every part of your body. Because we live in the body, right? We live in the body. Like it or not, <laughs> you know, no matter what shape it's in, we live in it. And that's where sin impacts us. So he says, don't offer any parts of yourself as, as an instrument of wickedness. But number four, offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought 
from death to life. And that's really what happens when we receive Jesus. We're brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Every part of yourself. You know, the all or nothing approach normally isn't a good thing, but when it comes to, to serving Jesus, it's a good thing. Give it all. You know, give it all. It saves you from a lot of decision making of saying, well, Lord, do I want to obey this time or not? We can say, you know what? I've already decided I want to obey Jesus. And I might fumble it now and then, but I still want to obey Jesus. That's a decision that's already been made. And no matter how much I might struggle, I'm, I'm going to stick with that decision because it's by his power. So offer yourselves to God. And I don't know this morning if you've ever done that or not. And... I'm not going to have you come forward or anything like that as much as just sit where you are and ask yourself, have I done this? Do I see myself as dead to sin and alive to God? Am I willing to offer the parts of my body a living sacrifice to him? And that's what baptism, Paul tells us, is all about. That's what it symbolizes. That we are buried with Jesus. The life that we lived before accepting Christ, it gets washed away. And we are resurrected as a new person with new power. And I'll tell you, it makes a difference. It makes a difference. When you make this decision, whether it's at the exact same time as you get baptized or you just realize later what it meant or you realize earlier what it meant, it makes a difference. You will, you'll have a new sense of spiritual power. God will be free to use your life and you'll have an, a brand new dimension. I don't know if you remember receiving Jesus. That was a wonderful experience, wasn't it? You know, to feel clean and free in his sight. And this is very much similar when we say, you know what, I'm just going to quit fighting this body of death and I'm going to surrender it all to Jesus. I'm going to give it all to him because he gave it all for me. Join with me as we pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word and we thank you, uh, Lord, for the power of Jesus, the power to put to death all that we are without you, and Lord, for the resurrection power to live within us. Lord, I pray that you would speak to each of our hearts, Lord. Lord, that you would send your Holy Spirit to motivate our decisions, and Lord, help us to be willing to put to death that old nature and to live from this day forward for you and you alone then God help us to do that practically through our daily lives and to remember that we've given it all for you. Lord, because we trust you. Then let us walk in newness of life and in your resurrection power, Lord, until that day that we see you again. And Lord, give, that, give us that hope in our hearts, that hope that's based on you, not on us because we ask it in your name, amen.